actually is knowledge that, that is very valuable for the state. It can save its population from needing treatment in the first place. It can enact policies to remove things from food if they turn out to be carcinogenic. So that's um, the importance of that. Welcome back to Have a Map, where we talk all things career. I'm your host, Mamadou Njai, and today is a nice day in Chicago, finally. It was just snowing a few days ago, which was crazy in the middle of uh, April, but uh, less about that. Let's get the podcast started. Uh, let me start with introducing one of our shining interns, Nashok. Nashok, say what's up to the people. How's it going? Everyone, um, I'm Nashok. I'm a current uh, IO intern at Dim Events. Perfect. And where are you calling in from today? Uh, I'm currently situated in uh, Georgia, uh, in the U.S., of course, so East Coast time. It's been a little windy out here, but otherwise can't, can't really complain about the weather as much. Lucky you. Very lucky. <laughs> uh, and let's get right into it. Our guest for today, Chris, how are you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? Good, good. And Chris, where are you calling in from? I, I think we got a different time zone over there, right? We, we do, we do. It's the afternoon in London, England, and uh, it is also very sunny, very pleasant, very difficult to concentrate on work. Wow, yes. And I'm sure that's that's a little bit more rare for London to be a very sunny, nice day. Uh, this is sunny for about uh, two months, and that's about it, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, that makes sense. Very cool. Well, Chris, tell us a little bit about what you do um, and who you are, and let's just jump into it. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm the head of policy and media uh, at Understanding Animal Research. So uh, our aim is to help people understand how and why animals are used in research. Um, they can make up their own mind about, about that. Uh, but it's a very complex topic, extremely complicated science. Uh, that has to be described usually in very small snippets. And uh, as the head of policy and media, I work with government and uh, our politicians, our parliamentarians, um, to help them understand all of this and to help them regulate it. Um, I'm also the head of media, which means the national media, BBC, that kind of thing. We also have myth-busting uh, charities in the UK, like Full Fact, um, who try to demystify all of this working with them on facebook myths is always fun um and there's there's of course loads of myths around animals and, uh, covid research for instance is obviously massively in the news at the moment there's also conspiracy theories and it's about picking through those those complex areas um because if you don't truly understand the area you're, you're likely to be not only ineffective but counterproductive it's very very important and that's a transferable skill um, in my policy hat, I, I started out in think tanks. Uh, but if you're going to change the world in any way, you really have to understand what you're dealing with. You have to place narratives aside to a degree and focus on the, the nuts and bolts of, a, of the situation. In the UK, we have been regulating animals in research since 1875. Charles Darwin actually helped draft the first law and we've had an inspectorate ever since then. And it's always been the case that you can't use an animal if there's an alternative way to proceed with the experiment. Uh, in more recent years, we've tried to pioneer alternatives. So we fund that more than anybody in the world, I think. This core funding of about uh, 10 million pounds is, I don't know what that is, dollars. It's possibly $13 million um a year in core funding for what we call the nc3rs which is aiming uh, it's about reducing um replacing it and uh animals and research and refining the experiments to as much as possible remove suffering so uh, that's working um a lot of our experiments are extremely mild um in fact the uh, we have various categories um of experiments mild medium severe which is what it sounds like uh but also sub threshold so that's very, very, very light. You know, it might just be the birth of an animal. Nothing further happens to it. That's about half of experiments, by the way. So um, yeah, that's my, my daily life is doing that, working directly with the scientists churning out this research, um, usually before it's terribly evident what it's going to be used for. Um, the uh, Pfizer and Moderna 
COVID vaccines are based on a 2005 patent from the University of Pennsylvania, for instance. Uh, and before you actually put this research into the real world and it starts saving lives, there can be a lot of questions about why are we funding this? You know, is this ever going to be useful and that kind of thing? So we have a number of historical examples we can use to say, yes, it usually is. <laughs> it does come good in the end. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That is, you, you just blew my mind already this morning. Um, that's very fascinating and interesting. And even just going to the part of like Charles Darwin being the first person to write, you know, policy for that is is very cool. I have a few questions before we we just get it there, uh, Nashok, if you want to jump, jump in as well. So I was looking up 10 million pounds, 13 million pounds for our U.S. listeners or almost 14 million uh, dollars, I'm sorry, for our, our U.S. listeners. And one thing that was really interesting is you said that the patent for the Pfizer and Moderna um, vaccines was something that was funded in what, 2005 or you said 2015? It was patented in 2005 by the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, most, most basic research is done in universities. In fact, most animal research is done in universities. Um, it might, dis discovering how the body works might lead you to a drug down the way, but it's based on basic fundamental knowledge. And that's where that's comes from universities. So if that project doesn't get funded in 2005, then it puts a lot more stress on us in 2020. Exactly. And, and that's exactly, we have the same thing in the UK with the uh, Oxford um, AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, their top tip is start 10 years ago. Uh, because that's what we did. We were working on um, what the World Health Organization was calling disease X. Uh, they didn't know when it was going to be or what precise kind of thing it was going to be, but we did know that we have international travel. And that means that whatever it was is going to travel the world. Um, the 1918 Spanish flu only spread because uh, soldiers were coming back from the First World War, and that's what spread it across the earth. That's now routine. We do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> millions you know people traveling to and fro it was definitely going to spread so we needed a you know we need to be ready ahead of time and that means do you have glass vials do you have specialized rubber that can survive minus 70 in the fridge you know th those kinds of things it sounds so silly but when the pandemic actually hits that's the kind of thing you need to have down so the other thing was what's the vaccine platform going to be do you have your clinical trial volunteers pre-screened uh, you know, are they healthy enough to take part? All the stuff that normally slows down vaccine development 10 or 15 years, we did it ahead of time. When it hit, we just needed that DNA from the, from the uh, Chinese scientists to stick it inside an adenovirus and create the vaccine. The rest is manufacturing. Wow, amazing. Michelle, I'll let you jump in here because I know you got a question. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know you had a little... Um, about your day-to-day -day. I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate on on how you engage with with uh like animal research scientists and how how you also push uh that data outwards towards the media because I've done a little bit of uh stuff like policy uh policy writing and uh policy briefs and stuff in in like previous classes so I was wondering how how much of it actually transfers into into your actual engagement between scientists and people in general? People in general, uh, we, we kind of, it used to be that I'd have to go to researchers and, and just ask people if anything interesting was going on. I maybe work with their press offices and said, you know, what, what's the most interesting research you're doing at the moment? I could then translate that to politicians and media. But something's changed over the last 10 years, which is we pushed something called the Concordat on Openness in Animal Research. And the idea was rather than people trying defensively to describe what their research was for, just go out and tell people. You've got a press office at the university or at the you know, pharma company or whatever. Be completely open about how you've used the animal and what it's led to and why you think it was worth it. Don't try to moralize, don't try to tell them that's great things, don't spin it. Just tell them what's happened and just, you know, trust them to be intelligent enough to make their own mind up in line with their own personal morality. So that was the idea. And 
all of the uh, research funders and people who undertake it have uh, signed up to it. It's about 125 organizations in the UK, Oxford University, for instance, and all the big learned societies. And what they then do as the research comes through on the pipeline, they then push it out through their press offices and they do press releases and they might talk to the local politicians, invite them into the lab, that kind of thing. It's a sort of open outreach and it's a two way process where people can ask questions of the university and they can have open days. People are actually innovating in all these different ways, all to the end of being open. Um, then at the end of that, there might still be questions, you know, moral or technical or whatever. We can get to that then. Once people have the understanding of what has happened and it hasn't been spun and it hasn't been exaggerated, then you can have a conversation about what's left, which is a question for society. You know, should the experiment happen? Uh, how much money should be pushed into it? I know you have lots of, uh, you know, you have sort of small state conservatives that are a, a worldwide feature. And they never, they never seem to think you should fund science. They think you should leave it to the private sector. But there's usually no return for an investor on something, say, if it uh, reduces the number of cancer cases. No, no, no investor can make money from that. So uh, actually, it's knowledge that is very valuable for the state. It can save its population from needing treatment in the first place. It can enact policies to remove things from food if they turn out to be carcinogenic. So that's... Um, the importance of that is, is a kind of a drip drip process rather than me turning up and giving you two or three examples. It's the lived experience of politicians to receive things from universities for to be in the papers. Um, and it reduces the opportunity for anybody to spin it for their own gain, basically. And it has that, you know, it's, it's a conversation. If the public is funding research, it should know what's coming from research. They have a right to know. So it kind of works out better for everybody if that, if that happens. Um, and on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, I will map parliamentarians to figure out who I need to be speaking to, who's on committees, um, you know, what parliamentary committees are, are discussing this stuff. Just last night, I was, I was on a parliamentary committee as, a, as an expert witness on the panel. They were asking, what more do we need to do in what areas to further reduce this? Which is a perfectly fair question. Um, and we had some suggestions. And again, it will require public funding. Um, to deliver what the markets don't naturally deliver on their own. Um, if you, you can't really solve a, a, a moral imperative using a market forces because everything needs to have a profit before it's done. So actually, you need to nudge that along. You need to sort of, you know, seed certain things if you want to see it going the, the other way. It'd be, it might be similar to sort of climate change or something like that. You know, if the, if the government um, makes it more attractive to get renewable energy, then that gets that market going, you know, up and running. Then you can just leave it to look after itself. But it wouldn't necessarily have delivered that because if the bottom line was profit, then that doesn't really equate to environmental, you know, the switch away from petroleum or something like that. So it's, it's, it's pretty much the same across the whole of science. If you want that outcome, you've got to, you've got to see the investment and, and nudge things in the way that you'd like to see them go. I'm a little bit more, uh knowledgeable about that um do you ever find it uh a little hard to um to kind of translate that science the the science side over to uh politicians because i mean i've always heard a lot about people struggling to get like grant money and uh and just scientific funding in general absolutely it's hard and it's very hard to break into echo chambers but it's our job to be where the audience is uh, we can't simply broadcast and say, but we did a fact sheet on that. You need to get it in front of people's uh, faces. And sometimes that, if you, you know, there's very particular ways of approaching politicians, for instance. Uh, they don't vary a massive amount between countries. Um, it's that they have a staff, but they sometimes, they can, they're going to have to be, they're going to have to make the final decision on certain things. It might be something like a, it's like a diary date. Um, you know, the, the staff may not know what the politician knows. Like, is that somewhere the politician wants to be? Are those characters people they want to meet? Um, how important is this uh, to the politician? So depending on what you send to a politician, if you send them your annual report, it will end up in a big stack of annual reports that will never be read by anyone. If you invite the politician to an event, well, then there's a greater chance that the politician will have to consider that invitation at least. So now you're in front of them. 
and you can and it's your message is what what can you put in an elevator pitch in a diary uh, in a diary uh, letter um, that could grab their attention you know what are you sending to their offices that would make it stand out and I, I've worked in a parliamentary office before so I, I'm sort of aware of how it feels when something turns up in the office I know uh, there's one uh, news corporation that wanted to wanted to everyone to come to a big event of theirs. And that might have got lost, but they sent it on a piece of Perspex. This big Perspex, Perspex disc. And you're thinking, what do I do with this thing? You know, it's grabbed your attention more than anything else. And in a, a politician's world, everything is coming from so many issues, you know? Um, and uh, then there's members of the public sending them abusive letters and all sorts of stuff, actual things they need to sort out, you know, actual work they need to do uh, in the legislature. Um, what do they do when this big Perspex thing turns up? You know, it, it drew attention to that brand in a way that was fantastically expensive, but um, uh, also really worked. You know, nobody's going to forget that invite because it was such a strange thing to receive. But it is those kind of little tricks of just trying to get someone's attention who's phenomenally busy and try to see it from their perspective. Just how many things are bombarding. Um, it's not necessarily about the quality of your message but it is about how you can get it across and better get creative in some cases do you utilize the media to try to get it in front of policy makers um faces or you know what i mean to put it out there if you've tried those other routes first do you well yeah well? That, that's that's the context uh, in which they're operating. If everybody, if everybody settled down and watched the same news story, that's great. The only thing is the media these days is quite uh, fragmented and there's a lot of echo chambers. So some news just doesn't get in front of people. And some people are surprised to find out, you know, politicians, for instance, that nobody's heard of them. And there's one guy running for a mayoral position in, a, in an election in a couple of weeks up in the, the Midlands uh, of the UK. He's been, he's been a minister before. He's been all over the news. He's been on every news chat, uh, program you can think about and something like only 30 people have heard of him. You know, amazing. And he's running as a candidate in their area. You know, most people just don't look at the same stuff. They also tend to be quite sensitized. So let's say they work in the housing industry and they climb on a, you know, metro train or something and they pick up the free newspaper. They're going to notice the stories that are relevant to housing. You know, another guy turns to the sports pages, another guy to the finance pages. And, you know, a big scandal might happen in housing. And it's like, oh, they're like, oh, my God, oh, my God, this is, you know, terrible. You know, but most people didn't even see that story. They kept going past it. You know, one guy, all he remembers about the paper is the big you know, infographic about a you know, satellite or something in the middle. You know, they, some people are turning that into the horoscope. There's, a lot of people just don't, aren't aware of this stuff. So all you can do is a kind of drip, drip of, this is why we're doing this, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, and that creates a sort of um, the context in which, you know, politicians come about. And certainly in the UK, there's quite a lot of churn in politics. Um, every election, every five years or so, you might lose a third of people um, who were previously, you know, two days ago, they were a big deal. So was their staff, their, their entourage, and they are just completely denuded of power. They're nothing now. They just go, you know, they're gone from the from the from the pitch, and you're left, you know, with a third of new people, and, and whoever's left of the other two thirds is suddenly takes on a new importance, you know. Someone who was just like a lowly backbencher that nobody ever listened to is suddenly deputy prime minister. It's like, oh, you know, yeah. they suddenly gained a great deal of power. So it's like it's worth talking to everybody because you never you never know, particularly in the UK, who's suddenly going to ascend. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, in, in policy, that's certainly, that's certainly what we do. Um, we will translate stuff specifically for MPs, though. They're, they're a special case. We don't, um, we don't transmit stuff out there and, and assume they're going to read it. We, we will tailor it for them, and we'll go to them directly and say, look, you've got a university in your constituency. It's leading the world in you know, this kind of specialism. Do you want to go and see them, talk about it, maybe, you know, <laughs> and support them? You know, that that's kind of how we would approach that problem. Definitely. And then my last question in this space is with media changing so much and a lot of social media coming to the forefront, is that something that you all 
are utilizing as maybe not an equal tool, but something that you see that's kind of transforming to becoming a more equal tool to get messages and, and mm -hmm. information out there as well. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, we, we concentrate a lot on infographics and our reach is, is large. It's in millions. Um, it's very difficult because when we put something out, we might see a lot of people using it, but it might be the same old people. Mm. Uh, if our job is to get to those voices that don't see that, then we've really, it's, a, it's a, a, quite a hill to climb. We do reach out to other organizations who are in different spaces to say, hey, you know, would you like to talk about this too? Do we, you know, if, just, if we can get that in with these people, with your constituency, your audience like to know about this? Um, but we have to go in, we have to figure out who those organizations are uh, and, and go in that way. And we, we had that same problem though years ago. We had, before the internet really took off uh, as people's primary news source, we had it with newspapers. And the people we really needed, we had real trouble getting to people who were particularly females between the ages of uh, 20 and uh, 44. Really difficult. And the people who we were trying to get, we could get the, the higher social demographics because they read the newspapers and the other ones didn't. But they read they read in store magazines of like Walmart. It's like that's what they read. That's where they got the information. It's like, okay, how am I going to tailor this now? It's like, but there, there is always a way in. You know, there's always people get diseases. They get cervical cancer. Okay, you've got a way in. You know, is there a product link to that? You know. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's 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 always been a little bit echo chambery, uh, but it was easier when you had fewer press titles because you just got them all to cover stuff in their own way. Now, you can't even get into some of those, you know, I don't know, I've never found myself in a QAnon Discord server or something, but, you know, they exist. And it's like, oh, man, you know, how are we going to get to these people? And who, who are we overlapping? So we do a bit of segmenting of our audience, figure out who's this for? I mean, I wrote an anti-vaccine, uh, you know, a, a vaccine myth-busting piece. And the people who are taking the vaccine are educated, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, they can take long letters, they're long words, you know, multi-syllable words and that kind of stuff. The people who aren't uh, have characteristics like usually poor science education, um, maybe, uh, you know, they don't read as well. So I better simplify my language. Because this, you know, I, I, what am I doing preaching to the converted of people who already want a vaccine? I've got to talk to the people who don't uh, and how dangerous that is for them. <laughs> and I've got to make it so they understand it. It's my job to make myself understood. It's not their job to struggle to understand me. Yeah, and that's obviously a very tough thing to do in the, the current climate uh, with everyone so solidly in their, in their head. And uh, I guess going a little bit further back, I, I wanted to ask you how you felt uh, or how you, how you got into this this position, this job, uh, like what what decisions and and uh, and career paths kind of led you here? Okay, well, when I was in the think tank, I realized that it was a little bit limited in terms of how they work. Often they dream up something that politicians will pay 500 pounds to come and see uh, you know seminar on or something like that and so the issues aren't I didn't find them necessarily lining up with real world issues that needed solving so and there, there's often a political agenda behind them as well um, increasingly so I really wanted to move away from that and so I moved to the front line basically which is in parliament and government and I, I worked in our parliament doing Select committee work largely for a, for a member of parliament. Uh, select committees look at specific um, areas of policy, you know, whether it's local government or something like that. Uh, so I did a lot of that and I was attractive to the MP because I had the think tank background. So I could do good policy and that's, that helped select committee to scrutinize our domestic industries and figure out where we need to be going with that. Um, after that, I moved to the private sector. And again, very transferable skill is figuring out unemotionally exactly what's going on. Because uh, only then can you advise a client correctly. 
Uh, but there is something, there's something extra there. I remember recounting this a couple of days ago, but um, I remember once standing in a, in a room with a load of different consultants. We all had different specialisms and different stuff. Mine was to look at the policy locally that would allow this project to go forward. Everybody was telling the client they were right, and I didn't. And I will never forget the look of the other consultants. They looked at me like, that's a dead man walking. We're not going to see you at the next meeting, that kind of stuff. But the client was quite intrigued. I mean, there's one guy who's saying, I'm not just saying, you know, I'm not just urging caution. Anybody can urge caution. You know, we shouldn't go too far. Well, I'm not suggesting we go too far. You know, it's like I was saying, the fundamentals here aren't going to work. These politicians aren't going to go for it. That is against that policy. And then they're, they're going to stick at that. And you're not going to be able to get it through on these grounds. So, so abandon it, change it. You'll need, to, you'll need to completely change how you do this bit. You can't proceed with the current project, it will fail. A couple of weeks later, they put it forward uh, with the advice of the other consultants uh, and it fails. All the other consultants get fired. I come back into a room full of new faces uh, with the trust of the client who I took on, you know, he had me for years doing other things. So that's a transferable skill and as, as is, trying to work on really complicated stuff. If you look at my CV, I've got nuclear decommissioning, um, I've put up wind farms. And th this is in an age when, believe it or not, people were pretty skeptical about the existence of climate change. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to say now, but people were really, really skeptical, like just not very long ago, about 15 years ago, there was, uh, and it, getting, even getting that across, like, well, why do we need this even? You know, it's like, well, <laughs> <laughs> it is the science and you know you have to figure out a way of, of helping them to relate to why we should stick up a wind farm on a nice green hillside you know why would it be important to them so those are kind of all transferable skills and uh, I ended up working in uh, an agency or, or several you know going up the pecking order but was slightly um, I felt that I wasn't making such a difference as I did at the very beginning of my career and I still hadn't hit where I wanted to be in terms of really, really complicated stuff. You know, climate change is complicated enough, but you know, where is the really, where are the really interesting um, areas? Uh, so I, I left an agency on gardening leave and I said, I'm not gonna go back to another one. Uh, I'm gonna go and find a job that, that delivers on all those metrics. It's gotta be challenging. It's gotta use all my skills. Um, I'd like it to be, policy and media based, but nobody, but nobody was doing those kind of jobs. And this one kind of fell in my lap. I just saw the, the, the job description read not only um, sort of, you know, with all the elements that are on my CV, but actually in the same order as my CV. Uh, I thought this is a great match. So I, uh, I joined up and um, it's a really interesting area. We, we have five year strategies because at the end of those five years, we're a whole new organization. We're talking, we're working in a totally new context. We've got different audiences. We, we can't just keep doing what, we've, what we did in the previous five years. We sit there, we horizon scan, and we say, okay, we're gonna be a completely different organization. So in essence, I've worked in one place for nine years, but in another way, I've probably had three jobs with the same job title. <laughs> Very amazing. That career transition is, is really cool just to see that. And I think it, it always is reassuring, right? To show the different areas that you can go in, but also utilizing those transferable skills within each space. And that's one thing we always talk about um, in our internship is, you know, even though you might go to university for a certain thing, um, you can kind of maneuver around that and pull from those skills that you have to jump into different uh industries or careers or whatever that might be um and it's a lot more flexible than you think you know if you think you just go into with university with this major you have to go into this direction it's not linear like that it's actually more of like a, a, a weird type of pattern that you can create on your own absolutely I and mean, at the moment i've got a secondment from the institute of cancer research working with me on policy showing her how this goes along uh, and, you know, our head of engagement is a former neurologist. Uh, but, you know, that you, you can do that. And, it's, and all of that stuff is really useful, you know, uh, in different ways. Yeah, no, that's so very, very important. And, you know, we talk a little bit about like branding. I don't know if branding is the exact type of wording, but mm. branding, I think, is 
interesting where you take it to a career perspective where you really can pull from like this is who I am and this is why these unique you I can't speak unique skill set <laughs> can apply to any other space you want to go into and I think if we look at careers more in like a I always say like a brand perspective, the same way you could look at like a celebrity or something of that nature and utilize that, it could help to transform a lot of these different spaces. So That's right. And that's, that's why it seems so much harder when you're starting out because you have less of a story to tell. Right. Uh, you got to figure out, a, a, you know, other ways of doing that. You know, I had responsibility for the school cash register just as it doesn't really say a lot about who you are and what your skills are going to be. Because actually, <clears throat> some of those qualities which I was, you know, talking about, standing up and being honest with the client, for instance, that takes a bit of courage. Mm-hmm. So that's part of my brand, is that, you know, I, I'll, I'll talk about using animals and research on TV. That takes courage. Yeah. But is that, you know, that's, that, that's what helps. Is, you know, let your true self come out. Definitely. And one thing I wanted to ask, we always talk about self-care and taking care of oneself to be, you know, um, rejuvenated to go into work on a constant Mm. basis. And for you, you're changing the world, um, working on policies, working on helping other people out. And I'm sure that can be stressful. So for you, how do you take care of your mental state and how you're going about day to day um, in your life? It's very important to take some time for yourself if you can, I think. Uh, but everybody's going to respond differently. Some people are going to need to go for a run. Uh, previously, I've, uh, I've written a lot of songs. They're probably thinly veiled references to what's going on in, the, in my day-to-day life. But, you know, uh, that, that helped to be a pressure valve, well, particularly when I was doing very long hours and that kind of stuff. It, it gave me somewhere else to go in my head and something else to do when I wasn't working uh, that was so totally different and so creative and engaging because I, you know, I play lots of the instruments. And um, so that was good. And then I got to put them out on Spotify and there's a certain number of people who listen to them. And it's so different to what I do in my day-to-day life that I'm, I'm not defined by that, by my career necessarily. It's something I do, something I enjoy, but it's something that I can step away from as well. Um, my, my boss, actually, she's very wise. And she said something else to me, which was, which was important because I I, I've never taken a lot of holiday. Uh, and she said, take two weeks. She said, you know, a few days isn't enough to completely step away from what you're doing. And if you take a couple of weeks, you'll come back refreshed with new ideas. And that's, that helps everybody. You know, it helps you to forget about everything else, you know, just a, a few days. So that's, those, those would be my, my top tips. I mean, after I do you know, a particularly stressful presentation to a, a committee or something like that, I might, uh, I'll go walk around the park. You know, I go and pick up my daughter. You know, it's, 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 it, I can take myself away and have another life. If you can cultivate that for yourself, that's very good. And another final thing, actually, the, uh, I, I've written some comedy scripts. <laughs> Again, not, not as part of, uh, part of the day job, but you know, I've, I've done it. And the advice I was given was always have three projects because everybody gets burned out just doing one thing all the time. Uh, but you, can, you probably have more energy than you think. If you just jump across to that other project, then you can you can plow yourself into that for a little bit until you until until the writer's block is gone from that bit, you can pour yourself into something else. So I, those would be the the major bit of self care because you you know you're, you're good enough uh, to do this job, but you know have interests outside of it as well so that you don't become stuck in that. Great advice. That is it is just it's beautiful to hear like comedy scripts, music, like that's really <laughs> cool. Yeah. Just to, you know, I'm sure not too many people know those things about you, but when you get to know a person, that's it just adds to it. And it's crazy how like these other creative outlets can, when you're doing it, it can make you think of an idea within your career. And most people don't yeah. realize that when you allocate time to other spaces, yeah. you're not taking away time from your, you are in some shape or form, you're taking away time, but you're restoring and rejuvenating yourself yeah. to get back to where you want to go and all the things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it can help you think it through. You know, if you think about how a song is structured, that can really help do certain things. I mean, if you're writing a, an article, writing, you know, writing it down to be read, that's one process. But if you're saying doing a script for a podcast or something like that, 
that's a lot more like a song, you know. <laughs> that's a you've got a, a, an entrance, you know. You've got something to say. Uh, you may even have themes that you return to. That fe- feels more to me like writing a song than it does writing an article. Yeah, actually, and on that, a little bit of a uh, a chorus from me, I guess I would say. Um, so you were talking um, about your uh, early kind of coming onto the job and. Uh, how you got here um and i was just wondering as as someone who's kind of like in a position where i'm trying to get that kind of experience and knowledge um, uh, and maybe a basis in that research do you potentially have any advice on how people um just like students maybe even can reach out and get uh connections within uh, animal research, research in general. Uh, I'm specifically interested in annual behavioral psychology research. Um, oh, nice. But and and I'm the the problem is I'm finding it a little hard to to like find how how to make those connections outside of like maybe a a definite college connection. Like I feel like a lot of a lot of at least in the U.S. a lot of that a lot of the research is of course still university based and tended towards undergraduate or graduate so the in-between people yeah. kind of feel left out I guess they are left out yeah they are, they are left out you're quite right I mean that's not how that works um, and I mean in the US there are um, organizations which talk about uh, animal research for instance but there's there's one which is entirely voluntary for speaking research and that's just researchers you know, there are uh, animal behavioral psychologists uh, uh, working in that um, and they give their time for free to do articles and that kind of stuff. Um, there's that, I mean, there's, there's not a lot in terms of sort of forums or groups of people who talk about that kind of thing. It is still largely based around academia. Uh, and like I say, you know, you've got things like speaking of research, which are at least creating a space where you can have a conversation about those things and learn about them. In the UK, we've tried other things. We had something called a pint of science, which was some idea. You have a have a pint of beer with a scientist, and that, that was kind of creating those those informal links. So we have a few more of those initiatives, but that's really something that I wouldn't I wouldn't say that's the primary thing I go to. I'd say those 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 kind of links that you make in your career are kind of made in your jobs themselves. You take those contacts on, you know, when you when you first do that. So um internships are obviously a great great way of connecting with with those things but it depends really where you wanted to end up i mean it, would it what, what would be your your ideal job for instance uh i mean just talking with um previous professors uh i'm very interested in in being able to actually study um like a specific animal um my my professor was specialized in uh chimp research so she's been giving me a lot of instructions about that we have a uh, actual uh, chimp haven a bit a little bit further up in in north georgia that i've been yeah. looking into um so a lot of that is kind of outreach and of course that's been a little hard with um covid and and quarantining yeah. and all that uh <laughs> makes it a lot harder to to actually engage with uh animals in that kind of situation yeah. so but I, I, I guess for me, it's, it, it's been kind of like a searchy feely for trying to find those kind of positions that are, mm. uh, that are available without, um, so I can get that experience. And that's what I've been really outreach yeah. and look, looking out for. Well, this is, again, is brand building. I mean, if you wanted to start with, um, you know, your, your, your specialism, then you can build the rest of your brand on that. Um, so, for instance, uh, Brian Cox, uh, physicist in the UK, I don't know how much you see of him in the States, but he, um, he was, used to be a pop star uh, who did uh, Things Can Only Get Better with Extreme, he called himself, and he was a keyboard player. And after that faded, um, he went and he became a physicist and he was working on the Large Hadron Collider. And just before it was turned on, uh, so a, a guy called, I think it was called Otto Rosler, a chemistry professor, said, if you turn that thing on, it will destroy the Earth. And Brian Cox was asked about this as a physicist, and he said he called him a nasty word, beginning with T and having four letters in it. And 
of course, that made the headlines. Uh, this, you know, a physicist has <laughs> called this like that. Uh, oh, did you know he was the keyboard player from Extreme? It like, oh. So it's like, um, or whatever it's called. I can't remember what their name is now. And um, yeah, uh, so uh, that meant that he suddenly had a platform and he's become a science communicator as a result of that. And we've got Sir David Attenborough, who's a bit of an institution in this country. But there's some, there's some sense that Brian Cox might be lined up for when, uh, when Sir David shuffles shot, shot off his pot of coil, but maybe Brian will step in. So he's been presenting science programs and all of that kind of stuff. He's still a physicist, but he's got this other spade. But he, he, it's based upon, it's premised upon his, uh, his work, as is, you know, the, if the, the people in speaking of research, you know, the, it's premised upon their knowledge within that field. So I think it's building that, you know, how do you want to, what do you want in the foundation of this? Oh, good advice. Very good. Um, and before we wrap up, uh, my last question for all of us is, you know, with these last few days or maybe the last few weeks, what song, album or artist would you pair how you felt or the, the vibe of these last few days or weeks? Um, what, how would you pair them with who you are and, and what you've been feeling during that time? I'd say uh, Boston more than a feeling. Because uh, <laughs> for me, it's all about the detail. <laughs> and as we were moving through COVID, uh, I was explaining how animals was help, were helping us get through this, researching what it was and the vaccine. For other people, it, it, it didn't matter. But I was explaining to the world how this was, you know, how animals were used to, to get us out of this situation. So for me, it was more than a feeling. It was something that was happening and uh, the details were Love that. I love that. And Ashok, what about you? Uh, I mean, I'm going to come at this with like a little bit more of a, I don't know, kind of like cynical, but on the way up kind of look. <laughs> um, I think the album that's recently been kind of uh, on my mind resonating with uh, is definitely Doom Days by uh, Bastille. Okay. Um and like just like a lot of that album is is like a uh is kind of like a where are we going uh and like our what's like what is the per like what is our purpose but also kind of like with a tinge of like a bittersweet uplook where they're like D we could we could be something we could be better i think so i feel like that's yeah for me that's like both where i am personally and then also like looking at the world um like hopefully we're going towards a better future kind of thing i like that yeah i like that i'm gonna pick there's a song by uh um by nas called epmd off of uh oh yeah 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 off of uh jesus and the black messiah i think uh off that album and you know, it talks about the growth of him and hip hop and all of that stuff. And I, and I really, I relate to that as far as like COVID being a time of growth and reflection and, and really looking inwardly on what one vessel can utilize, which is our event company to kind of what we're doing with our internship program and helping to change the way that things are done and the impact on what the way that things are done and starting with interns to translate into impact rather than trying to go to the top and create impact that way. Mm -hmm. Very good. So yeah, look at that. All great songs. You all should listen to our, for our listeners. Um, and one, we just want to thank you so much, Chris. We'd like to give everyone a round of applause at the end of our podcast episode. <laughs> we appreciate you volunteering your time to chat with us and speak to our audience as well. My pleasure. Of course. Well, thank you to you all listening, whether this is your morning routine, afternoon routine, or something that you do before you go to sleep. Uh, we are out. Skr, skr.